So our speaker is uh, Professor uh, uh, Mark uh, Stevens. He's an associate professor at uh, Ecole uh, Hotelier of Lausanne, the very famous school for hospitality management, probably the most famous in the world. Uh, if you don't know anything about the school, it will suffice to tell you it's the first school that managed to get a Michelin star for its training restaurants. <laughs> How does it sound? The school that has a Michelin star. Uh, uh, Mark is going to talk to us about the link between creativity uh, and aesthetics in the world of uh, haute cuisine. Aesthetics are important for several reasons in, uh, in creativity. One, a great deal of the value of uh, products and services in the creative economy uh, has to do with their aesthetic appeal, which is very important. Two, uh, creativity, the creative economy is really propelled by individual level creative talent. So the aesthetics of something like the service or a product is a key differentiating factor. Uh, it's about uniqueness, so it's a competitive advantage. And the third aspect, which is really of interest of uh, people, management researchers like me and Mark, is that uh, the ability to create something that aesthetically is functional and works well, it means that the person, the people who do that, can really tackle with highly complex things, satisfying customer taste, satisfying the taste of uh, reviewers, uh, business imperatives, <coughs> cultural imperatives, and all the other things. Uh, Mark has done uh, the most interesting and extensive uh, research over the years in this world. He's going to talk about it. Uh, a few years ago, with two colleagues, we did a very, very large scale review of everything that has been published in the academic bibliography literature about creative literacy between 1957 and 2014, and we have dif different conceptual baskets in our mind. One of them was called Interesting Stuff. Uh, and some of the papers that Mark published came at the very, very top of, of that list, really interesting work. Uh, Mark is, uh, uh, is a researcher in this field. He's a management professor, so he's someone who knows very well how, to, how these ideas work also in an organizational sense. And because as probably you know, or I hope you know, most of us who are business school professors, uh, we used to have another life before. So in his previous life, he was a chef yeah. in a Michelin star restaurant. So he has this uh, beautiful uh, combination of uh, ground zero, ground level, practical experience and academic. And I'm fairly sure we are all going to join them. So please welcome Mark Benjamin. Uh, now I have to continue in English, unfortunately. <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for having me tonight. Uh, I'm very honored to be here at Alba. And uh, of course, when, when Barbie called me and uh, when I learned about his new center of uh, excellence in creative leadership, uh, I didn't have to think for a sec uh, second to accept the invitation because we are still a relatively small group of people, of academics in the world, interested in, in creativity. Uh, the whole world talks about innovation, of course, and, and understandably, because this is what, at the end, brings the money, brings the value. But if you think about <coughs> innovation, is actually an end result of a creative process. So it's actually very interesting to kind of at least try to understand what is happening before, and if we somehow can, you know, uh, influence that positively so that the likelihood of achieving innovation um, becomes bigger. Now, um, just a few words about uh, about myself. Um, similar to to Babis, I just uh, opened the first institute uh, at Ecole Hotelier de Lausanne called Institute of Business Creativity, and uh, we work together with. Uh, big uh, industry clients. Our, our biggest at the moment is uh, the Metro Group. Uh, Metro Group, probably you know it from uh, cash and carrier markets for the independent restaurateurs. But uh, until very recently, for example, Media Market was, was also part of the, of the Metro Group. So a very large, very reliable client. Uh, we are very, very happy with them. It's a, it's a good cooperation. And we do uh, practice-based research. Uh, so at the moment we look into a very important topic how we can innovate uh, vocational training and education in the hospitality industry and I think that's a very important topic for, for Greece as well uh, because there is a worldwide struggle to actually find people, uh, competent people for our industry not only in the kitchen but also in the service and the hotels everywhere and uh, I think we have to rethink how we can actually motivate young people 
to work in that what I think is a beautiful industry, but it's a very peculiar industry. It's uh, long working hours, and and uh, basically you work when when your friends and families uh, enjoy a leisure time. Um, but it's a beautiful industry. Good. Now, um, I will try to tell a story. Uh, I try not to be an academic for a few minutes and I will try to tell the story from my past as a chef in Michelin star restaurants but also from the time when I was a very young researcher and I started my PhD many years ago uh, in the world of haute cuisine and how I was fascinated when I basically met my, my stars Right? When I was a chef, these people I talked to, these were the, the role models. And, and finally they were in front of me and I could ask them all the questions I always wanted to ask them. And um, I do this through the lens of uh, aesthetics. Uh, actually something um, that uh, Babis is responsible for. Because many years ago uh, we got in contact because uh, uh, I showed him some of my work. And uh, like it very often happens when you're so deep in your work and you, you, you basically, it's in front of your nose, you sometimes need to step back or a good friend has to come in and basically points to the obvious that you cannot see because you're so close. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, you actually talk about aesthetics. And suddenly it was clear. Yes, it was about aesthetics, but at this point in time, I could not, I could not make it. Uh, so, a question, why Michelin star chefs? Uh, when you think about, um, at least we, we try to believe that we are all creative. And probably this is one of the biggest questions in creativity <coughs> research, whether creativity is inborn, whether it is developed. Uh, I believe it is probably a bit of both. Um, and uh, think about the creativity of a child. When a child starts to learn how to draw a tree, for the child, it's a very new creative act. It's something new, it's exciting. But of course for us who have done that since many, many years when we know how this works, it's nothing exciting. So I was very much interested in trying to understand creativity at the, at the top level. So really the expert level uh, creativity, which of course naturally it's, it's a very elitist approach. But I also believe that if we want to learn something fundamental, something essential about a phenomenon, we, it helps to learn from the best as well. And another reason uh, is of course a personal interest because I like eating, obviously, and uh, I have been a chef, so I'm, I'm fast, still fascinated by that industry. But there's also a very good reason, um, academically or from a research perspective, that we actually have um, a guide called the Michelin Guide, and there are others as well, like the Gourmet Guide, uh, where it is basically globally, almost globally, and publicly acknowledged who is creative and who is not creative. This does not mean that the chef who does not have a star is not creative, but at least here we have a reference point and we can say, look, there, it, there it's written, you know? So the, the sample is justified, so to speak. Uh, and these are the reasons why I looked into uh, Michelin star chefs. Now, um, why creativity in aesthetics? Uh, Babis already mentioned uh, the importance of aesthetics, but from a research perspective, it's also very interesting because aesthetics was actually only researched uh, from the perspective of judges who look at the quality of uh, the aesthetic quality of an invention, of a, of a product or service, and uh, it has really been brought into uh, connection with creativity itself and there's almost no research done that tries to understand or better understand uh, the aesthetic knowing, aesthetic knowledge of the creator. So basically during the creative process. And I think this is a, a fascinating question. It's, it's very, very difficult to research as you can imagine because if you think about creativity the thing that fascinates us is actually that thing that we cannot grab, right? So we, we, we can study the creative person on the one side and we can say, well, they are difficult people or they are funny people or they're grumpy people. And we can look at the outcome. 
and we can dissect them, we can take it apart, we can maybe see certain kind of patterns that we can replicate. Uh, just a, a little side story, you probably all know Salando, the big online uh, closed market. Uh, they run artificial intelligence at the moment. Of course, it's a very hot topic, artificial intelligence and human creativity, right? Where is the, where is the overlay? <coughs> and they can, within a millisecond, analyze the 2,000 top sellers of dresses, <coughs> and the artificial intelligence can, within five minutes, create another new 2,000 that aesthetically replicate the form of the dress that was the best seller, right? I don't think it will be at the level of Karl Lagerfeld. It will be not something really new, but it's probably good enough for 80% of the market, right? and especially at this price, at this price level. Um, so the, these are these are the very reasons. The, the thing in between the creative process that is really the fascinating part. Let me just go quickly back here, uh, just to give you an idea what this aesthetic all entails, because aesthetic is a very fussy concept. Um, when we think about aesthetics, we very often think about the things that we see, the visual. And in philosophy, there's very often uh, a very close link between aesthetics and beauty. And I think this is, this is very much justified. But beauty also in other things that we can sense. So there can be beauty in taste. There can be beauty in a fragrance. Think about the parfum. I will talk about this later. There can be a beauty in, in, in the things that we hear. Music, of course. And here, just, just to give you an example of how far these top chefs actually go. Uh, this is a dish. Um, it's a, a sea urchin. Mm -hmm. uh, dish uh, created by Richard uh, uh, Ekebus, a Dutch chef uh, in, in Hong Kong. And, uh, he actually hired an industrial designer uh, uh, who created a plate just for that particular dish. Right? It will not be used afterwards for any other dish. It's just for this particular dish. Um, just to give you a little overview of, of the chefs uh, that I have that I have studied, um, over three dozen Michelin star chefs. And for those of you who, who don't know the Michelin system, so um, there is a, a big gourmet, it's called, it's basically a, a very good fine dining restaurant would get this, this, this kind of award. And then the star system starts from one star to three star. Okay? And three star restaurants are very, very rare in the world. Maybe around 120, the, the figures of course change every year, but it's very rare if you look at the amount of restaurants uh, uh, available in the world. Uh, so I, most, most uh, uh, chefs that I visited, that uh, I studied, were, were in Europe, uh, UK, Spain, France, Germany, uh, Austria, and so on. And then, of course, at my, at my school also, uh, we did a, a check of our sense-making of these, of these interviews with a so-called Meilleur Ouvrier de France. Um, this is a, a, a title that some of the craftsmen in, in France um, have, and that is basically a, 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 a sign that they are at the top of their craft and they are responsible <coughs> for the education and training of the next generation. And, and this was an important step, and then we did another round of, of interviews with, with people in the Netherlands and Singapore and so on. Now, um, one part uh, or one, one phenomenon that came out is that we um, found something that we titled aesthetic composing. And it's really literally a composing, uh, like Johann Sebastian Bach would compose his music, these chefs compose. And of course they have very different backgrounds and, and I will uh, introduce some of the chefs afterwards and I'll tell a bit of their background story and their vita. And uh, essential in the composing are three elements. And, and I think they are really fundamental. And also, I don't have empirical evidence for that. I believe that we can find them in many other fields as well, where there is a creative process. Uh, that is aesthetic emotion, 
aesthetic simplicity and aesthetic harmony. Now, emotion is probably the easiest to understand intuitively. It happens when we see something, we smell something, we touch something, and we have a positive or negative feel about it, hopefully <coughs> positive, right? Uh, but if you think about the world of art, uh, certain paintings are very powerful, they were very important for the history of art, but they are somehow disturbing. Think about Picasso's Guernica, right? It's not necessarily a beautiful building, uh, a built, uh, picture, painting, but it is a very important one, and it has its own aesthetics. Then simplicity, it's very, very difficult. Why? Because I think this is really the mastery. This is where you can see the master. Uh, because it's like Einstein, you know, as simple as possible, but no simpler. Uh, like a very good piece of art where you don't want to put something more, but you also don't want to take something out. It is exactly how it should be. And uh, actually we can show that, uh, and I'm sure that, that you have all experienced that. I'm thinking back to my uh, beloved school at back home, where, where the students also cater all the F&B outlets. And sometimes we we'll give them a bit more creative freedom to do something, to write a little menu in the food court where, where all the faculty members eat and all the guests that come. And <clears throat> sometimes they are over ambitious. And you get a dish that has certain elements that are very, very interesting, but it's overloaded. Um, there is a cuisine called fusion cuisine. Uh, we always sarcastically say this is confusion cuisine. <laughs> <laughs> because there are simply certain elements in there that do not work yet. Uh, maybe you can picture a teenager. A teenager needs to learn how to grow up. And in that process of growing up, sometimes becomes extreme, right? They have to go to the boundaries, they need to check and uh, to tone down afterwards and to realize, okay, probably here somewhere is, is, is the real life, right? This is how I can, can uh, continue to, to develop. And harmony is of course something that I, I guess all human beings naturally want to achieve and is simply the balance of the different ingredients uh, together, right? Um, and that's a very interesting uh, starting point, harmony, for many chefs, especially the, the more avant-garde chefs, uh, to basically deconstruct the harmony. Uh, famous chef Ferran Adria, that probably many of you have heard of, uh, he had the famous restaurant uh, close to um, Barcelona called El Bulli, and he became known as the godfather of molecular gastronomy. Now, molecular gastronomy is a term that was invented by a journalist <coughs> to have some very fancy title for his for the first uh, newspaper clip that was written about this uh, about this new style of cuisine. It's totally wrong because boiling an egg is molecular, right? There's nothing new in the term molecular gastronomy. The chefs actually talk about avant-garde cuisine, so an artistic approach to cooking and. Um, what uh, Ferran Adria did, uh, among many other things, is that he looked at this aesthetic harmony and he used deconstruction. So basically, I give you a very simple example. Uh, <coughs> a cucumber salad. You slice, you, 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 you dice, or you cut the cucumber in any form or shape, and then you add normally mm -hmm. some form of acidity, lemon juice, vinegar, salt and pepper. And he said, can we not reverse that? Can we not basically take the juice of the cucumber and make it the vinaigrette, make it the, the, the acidic part, right, the juicy part, and then we look for a very mellow uh, uh, citrus fruit that can be eaten like this, and we basically assemble these elements, these essential elements, in a completely different way. And this is a, a very logical and very easy <coughs> approach to come up already with some potentially very exciting new things by simply deconstructing what we already know. Now, the first chef that I want to introduce here, because... Uh, so what did you do? 
Sorry. So what did he do? He he took a very uh, a mellow lemon fruit uh, that you can eat. So like a you know you like the pomelo. Mm -hmm. So it's not very high in acidity, uh, very pleasant to eat. And he took the uh, cucumber and he made a juice out of of the cucumber and then marinated uh, the pomelo. So he fruit. actually did it. He did it. Yeah, yeah, he did that. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the first chef I want to introduce um, today is um, Fergus Henderson. Uh, Henderson is actually a self-taught chef. He uh, has his one mission in Start restaurant in, in London. Uh, he has been an architect in his previous life. And uh, he is a real connoisseur. And he was the first one. Uh, might sound a bit... Uh, strange because actually that should be a very natural form of, of eating, but he basically reintroduced the nose to tail eating, mm. right? So uh, basically a very, very, uh, uh, yeah, like I said, a very ancient and natural form of eating because if you kill an animal, we should have the respect to make use of as many parts as possible. Um, and uh, this is what he does. So basically, he gets the entire animal in, and you would get uh, uh, picked shanks, you would get the ears, you get the snout, you, everything uh, cooked to a Michelin star level. Right? Of course, it's not for everybody this kind of kind of food. Uh, but he has uh, a competitive edge uh, because of that uh, unique selling proposition, and uh, uh, works very well. It's a very very simple environment, almost like a. Uh, uh, artisan cafe or, or philosopher's cafe, white walls, wooden chairs, wooden tables, very simple environment, delicious food, and um, a very, very interesting person. Really, you, you see, he enjoys his own food and he becomes part of the, of the product, right? So, this is probably creativity on a on a simple idea level, reintroducing something that we do <coughs> for thousands of years. It's not so much in the <coughs> creative preparation of the food itself. Right? It's, it's basically the concept of eating the entire beast that he brought back to, to the culinary scene. Then, here's the man that I already talked about, Ferran Adria. Um, fascinating person. I, I still remember the interview that I had with him, and it was now it's 11 years ago that I talked to him. It took me about 20 minutes to break the barrier that was between us, because he has about, at this time, he spoke to about 10 journalists a day, and he thought, I'm a journalist, <laughs> and I needed to convince him, I don't want to know why you wanted to become a chef, because they all have the same answers like me, because we loved what our mothers were cooking, right? And they took us in the kitchen early on. And, and this was kind of the, the impetus for us to become chefs. Uh, so it really took me 20 minutes, but then it was an amazing, amazing conversation that we had. And just to show you how he really changed and fundamentally altered the culinary scene. So his signature dish with which he became really famous is the melon caviar. Now, for those of you who have not had the chance to eat that, uh, it's basically the essence of what became known as molecular gastronomy. You have two chemicals, and of course this is always the biggest criticism of molecular gastronomy, that they use certain chemicals uh, in the cooking. But basically, how it works is that you can cho uh, choose any liquid of your choice, you choose melon, melon uh, uh, juice, and add one liquid, add one chemical, and then you put it through this drop dispenser, and you put it in cold water, uh, that has the other uh, chemical in there, and what happens, the moment the liquid touches the water, it creates a viscous shell around the juice, but inside is liquid. So when you eat these pearls, like caviar pearls, they explode in your mouth, they have the same mouth feel, as we say, the same texture, but they taste after, after melon. Fascinating. Um, so this was his signature dish, but for for the managers in the room, those people who work in, in organizations on a, on a strategic level, I think what is very very interesting 
And of course, this is something that they tried many years ago at Siemens as well. And, and I had the pleasure to work uh, as an external consultant for, for Google, uh, where this, uh, to this date, works, I think, quite well, is the separation of the daily operations from the creative processes. I don't know how many of you have ever seen a professional kitchen. It is like the army. The moment the doors open of the restaurant, it's a very regimented process and there is only a one boss in the kitchen. I never question that. Uh, of course, it has changed slightly. Um, the, the choleric shouting head chefs that I still experience becoming less, but there's still a, a, a clear line of command. And what Ferranate I realized is this kind of creativity will be killed in such an environment. So basically what he said is, in order to, to really work creatively at the level like he intended to do, he, uh, he uh, rented a <coughs> laboratory space in the center of Barcelona, where he brought together <coughs> experts from different domains. Of course, relevant domains like an industrial designer, nutritionist and so on, who then outside the pressures and organizational pressures of the restaurant could work creatively together. Right? Like in, a, in, in any artistic environment and uh, in, addition, in addition to that, to that closed space, what of course is very interesting, when you bring together people from different domains, <coughs> a colleague of ours, uh, uh, Franz Johansson, calls that the Medici effect, right? You can sometimes find things in a neighboring discipline and you say, wow, if I, if I just translate it a tiny bit and bring it over, it can have tremendous effects, in <coughs> positive effects in my field. Right? And this, this kind of uh, bringing together and creating a hotspot, a creative hotspot, uh, worked, worked uh, really magic. Now, uh, the restaurant is closed. Uh, he has created the El Budi Foundation. And they, they do great stuff. Uh, for example, one thing that they work on at the moment is the Bullypedia. We all know Wikipedia, right? But this is really a, a almost scientific uh, uh, library of every existing gastronomic knowledge in the world brought together. Right? Um, it's not not quite up and running yet, but he's very close with that, and uh, yeah, a real a magician, a philosopher, a scientist, everything in one person. It's a really fascinating person. Um, another, another great, great character, Dieter Müller, uh, now semi-retired, <coughs> uh, probably one of our best uh, chefs in Germany, three Michelin stars. Um, very kind person and a uh, very quiet man, he was a very quiet leader, um, had a very good reputation in the, in the industry. Um, but uh, he comes from my part of Germany and we are called the Scots of Germany. We like to keep our money together. <laughs> and uh, it, drove, it, it, it drove him crazy that for lunchtime he couldn't fill his restaurant. Three Michelin stars, many courses, you spend at least four hours, right? And, and people wouldn't come for lunch. You know, he was always fully booked. So he said, how can I attract <coughs> the people maybe from the you know, closer areas where the hotel and the restaurant is for lunchtime? They said, first of all, we need to do something with the price. It needs to be, it needs to be very attractive price-wise. But then he said, look, they don't want to spend the time. So actually, they want to taste Dieter Müller. They want to have the big degustation menu, but short. And this is what he did. He basically made five courses consisting of four to five courses per course. In miniature version. So, uh, Amis Bush menu. Great success. Many other chefs copied that afterwards. Right? Uh, and I think for, for, for the purpose that he was looking for, a really, really good idea. And then, just uh, I put down here sweet bread and crayfish, uh, just to give you a bit of insight how creativity sometimes happens. He went into the walk in fridge, and what of, one of his young chefs put the sweet bread ne next to the crayfish. And he got angry. He said he knows that the fish should be somewhere else. 
because there could be cross co contamination, right? But then he said, wow, why don't we bring this together? And he actually worked on the combination of sweetbread with crayfish, and it became one of his uh, most famous dishes afterwards. <laughs> so sometimes serendipity really helps. Juan Roca. Now, for many, many years in Raw, he was voted number one restaurant um, yeah, in the San Pellegrino list. Three Michelin stars, three brothers, uh, therefore the, the three worlds. Uh, this is Juan Roca, he's the, he's the boss. Uh, he is basically responsible for all the savory dishes, and one of his brothers is doing the patisserie, the sweet, the sweet world, and the other brother is doing um, uh, is a sommelier. Now, the first thing I want to mention here is when they invited me for, for, for lunch, what was fascinating is how they integrate wine in the food. Now, normally, classically, we would talk about corresponding wines, right? So you have a a nice braised uh, beef cheek, uh, four hours uh, slowly cooked. So probably a Barolo would go quite well, or the wine we had last night, uh, the last one, would work perfectly. But here, the wine becomes an ingredient. So basically, you, you are almost forced to take the, the wine flight that goes with the wine. <coughs> and when you try the dish, it's very good, but it's not finished. And when you drink the wine, you, you immediately understand, now it's finished. It, it's in part of the ingredient, it's not corresponding, right? Very exciting. Um, but they're probably best known or became very famous because of, these, uh, of this invention. Uh, and he told me the story how it happened. One morning he was standing in the kitchen with his two brothers and his, his wife passed by. And he said, I love her perfume. If I could just dedicate a dish to her with that with that fragrance, but of course this doesn't go well a, a female perfume in a, in a savory dish, so it was automatically the thought okay it needs to be some some sort of dessert and his brother listened to that and I said, well let's do it and they went to a big perfume house they went to Donna Karen himself and asked, okay, what are the flavor components that you use <coughs> and they basically rebuilt. Donna Karen, New York for women, as a dessert. <laughs> so when they serve that, you get a taste of the original uh, uh, perfume, you smell, and then you eat that. And it really works. It's not, it's not some, you know, we, we try it and it's almost there. It works. It's exactly the same flavor combination. Then we have uh, Michel Pagot. Uh, very famous name in <coughs> all around the world because of his father and, and, and uncle, uh, who were one of the proponents of introducing the Nouvelle Cuisine uh, in the world. And a um, little story here. Uh, I think aesthetically it becomes probably very clear here. He's a big fan of Mark Rotko, the painter, and that's one of his dishes. <laughs> I think the Similarity is, is very clear, <coughs> but of course, what is interesting, this is two-dimensional. Here we have more dimensions because we can taste it. Mm. We have the temperature, we have even the sound of food sometimes, right? That's why we all like potato crisps. Mm. And once you take one, you cannot stop, right? <laughs> it's also because of the sound. Uh, and then a little story here that shows how deep philosophers and how deep thinkers these, these chefs are. Now, this is something that, that Michel Travaux invented. This is a layer of milk skin, a fraction of a millimeter thick. Now, I'm sure in Greece you still have proper milk. It becomes increasingly <coughs> difficult to find in, in Germany and uh, in Switzerland sometimes we can still find it. But basically, in the past, when you, when you boiled milk and you let it cool down a bit, there was the skin on it, right? And that's what he did. And he was the only one in his family who liked the skin. Everybody hated him. I said, but I want to replicate this childhood memory. Now, the concept of childhood memory is something every chef talks about. Because this, if you can replicate that and the audience can buy into and feel the childhood memory, you want them for life, right? Mm -hmm. This is when we go back home to our mothers or grandmothers and they cook our favorite dish. 
nothing can be wrong, right? That just works. Now, he said, of course, that's a cool thing, but I cannot boil always half a liter of milk and wait. I have to run a restaurant. Mm. So he also invented the machine that can create the milk skin, but on industrial scale, mm. so that he can use it in the dish in his restaurant. And then he said, okay, but what do I do with the milk skin? So it's not very exciting in a three-star Michelin restaurant to eat milk skin, right? I need to tell a story. I need to create a dish. And then he said, okay, now let, let me think. And he basically fills it with mousseron. And mousseron is a mushroom that grows in the field where the cows are. And it only gro grows because of the digestive system of the cows. Mm. Mm. So he closes the circle from milk, cow, mushroom, right? And this is how these, how these guys think, right? It's a, it's a deep story. It's a, it's a deep felt desire to create something out of the norm. Aduris. He is a protégé of Ferran Adria. And uh, he just blew me away with this story because I find it so relevant for the service industry when we have to complain, uh, when we have to handle customer complaints. This story is just for me amazing. Now, north of Spain, close to San Sebastian, um, avant-garde cuisine. One of the dishes was sardine ice cream. Now, sardine, very fatty fish, very fishy, right? Normally we know it from the barbecue or maybe put in vinegar, cold. It's a very strong fish. We cannot connect it to ice cream. And of course, his customers couldn't connect it to ice cream. So nine out of 10 customers bitterly complained. Normally these chefs, and I believe uh, Adoris uh, as well, have a big ego. Right? Otherwise they couldn't be chefs. Um, but he was a, a very clever businessman, very kind person, and he said, you know, I could easily say to these nine complaining customers, you know, who are you? I'm the big star, I have three Michelin stars, everybody knows me in the world, I don't care what you say. Right? But this is not what he did. So he went back to his sous chef, to his inner circle of, of uh, advisors, said, what's wrong? I love this dish. And they all said, it's great. It, and it makes sense to put it at this point in the menu, because a menu is like an album of your favorite pop star <coughs> or singer, right? There's a, there a logic to it. I said, but what is it? What is it? And then he spoke to a friend who was a psychologist. He said, you know, it's very easy. These people have no reference point. And this happened in Germany when they introduced the kiwi. You know how the the kiwi? kiwi. 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 You know how the Germans called kiwi. The, the kiwi? How they called the kiwi no. the first time? Hairy potato. <laughs> 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 and the taste, of course, something. If you taste something that you never tasted before, you need to find connecting points, yeah. reference points. So maybe if you eat a kiwi, you say, okay, there's a bit of of pineapple in it, right? Maybe yeah. something else, and you build your your kind of cognitive boxes. And his psychologist friend said, you know, do a very simple thing. Before you serve that dish, send a waiter or waitress to the customer and tell them to say exactly the same thing, uh, the, the, the following thing. Tell the customer, do you want to engage with us in a culinary adventure that is absolutely outstanding and it will be very exciting? Or if you don't want to be so adventurous today, we will bring you an alternative dish, very delicious, but less adventurous. Of course, we all want to be adventurous. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, almost no complaints, because the only person they could complain about is themselves. <laughs> so, a trick. I don't know if they liked it more, but at least they didn't complain about it, right? And it became part of the entire experience. So, very clever. So now I connect and I'm almost, I'm good with the time, I think so. Uh, aesthetic emotion. Now, Andre Jean, um, very famous uh, chef, when we ask him about uh, how he creates emotions, and this links very nicely back to what I just said about Chef Adolis, said, you know, 
In order to create an emotion, you need to tap and connect with something that people know and that people like. And he said, you know, very often I either use humor, that a dish is served in a humorous way. For example, Heston Blumenthal, a very famous chef from the UK, when he served his seafood platter, you had a, a big muscle, and at the time uh, the, you still had the iPods. He had an iPod in there with earphones, and you would listen to the sound of the waves while wow. eating your seafood platter. Right? That's humorous. It's a, it's a nice gimmick, right? But he said, you know, I do things like Snickers. Everybody likes the Snickers, everybody likes Coca-Cola, but I basically use the, those flavor components and I, I turn it into a properly grown-up dessert, right? But the moment you eat it, you eat the Snickers. <laughs> and everybody likes it. Right? Aesthetic simplicity, Raymond Blanc, uh, he was actually the godfather of uh, molecular gastronomy, but when he was asked by Ferran Adria and others whether he wants to be the front man, he said no. Uh, because for me, what we have done with that molecular approach was basically a scientific approach to cooking to better understand certain things and to improve uh, the craft, right? And, and, and maybe give some impetus for, for creativity as well. But I don't want to have this molecular idea at the at the forefront of, of, of food and a self-taught chef um, and his master was professor nicholas curti a, a physicist from the university of oxford who was interested uh, in food and uh, one story he said is you know I, I i got crazy i tried in my kitchen to make a souffle and it wouldn't work <laughs> so i called nicholas three o'clock in the morning said you have to come here you have to show me how we make a, a souffle right and they actually figured out how to make the perfect souffle in terms of process and it's it's it, it works it works free now and of course he 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 clearly said simplicity is really you know the the, the mastery this is really where you see the master's hand uh, and and if you look at this plate he has two michelin stars it is very simple but it's also very beautiful right mm -hmm. And actually, it is not as simple as it looks at first sight, because simplicity is not simplicity. Mm -hmm. It's the last refuge of complexity. Mm -hmm. This, this, this <coughs> salmon is actually cooked, but it's cooked at 53 degrees. Mm -hmm. So it keeps its color because the, the protein is not yet calculated, right? And when you eat it, it has nothing to do with sushi. You feel it is cooked. Mm. But it's a different texture than your typically barbecued uh, salmon or, or any other uh, salmon that is cooked at a higher temperature. Vacuum cooked? Sous vide and uh, at uh, 53 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Aesthetic harmony. Um, Corey Lee said, you know, this is, this is when it then all comes together. This is, this is, here he talked about masterpieces. And masterpieces that can be served at any time, but he said, you know, generations. Um, I always give to my students the example of a, maybe a Chanel costume for, for the ladies or a black Armani suit for men. Classic. It's classic. It works, right? And as a dish, uh, this is maybe not Michelin level yet, but, but I think we have all eaten it. Um, hot raspberries with vanilla ice cream. <laughs> If you think about this combination, the temperature differences, the texture, it, it is almost perfection, right? It's very simple, but it is, it is, it is almost perfection, right? And, and this is something that, of course, at some point was invented as well. Maybe it was in a serendipitous way, right? Because this was left in the fridge and somebody had the idea to, to heat up the raspberries because they maybe it didn't look so good anymore. This is very often how things like that uh, are developed. But the combination is just glorious. It is just very, very uh, exciting. Good. This was it from my side. And I believe Barbies will have a lot of questions now. Thank you. For me. <laughs>